Rook. Hey, Rook. Oh, I'm starving, man. It's been, what, two days since we've eaten. I know. I hear you, hot dog. I feel the same way, brother. But I'm sure we'll find something soon. We always pull through. Hey, what do you think of these guys we've been traveling with lately? Uh, they're all right. We've seen less trouble since we've been traveling in higher numbers. I still remember that day. It feels like an eternity ago now. Hot Dog and I, we traveled together for weeks, maybe even months, barely scraping by after our small town was destroyed. We were the only two that escaped with our lives. We found another group of drifters that were kind enough to let us travel with them, safety in numbers and all that. We were only with them for a few days and we just ran out of food again. I say, next stop we make, we gather food, not for ourselves, and travel west. You've heard of the hub, right? Yeah, of course I have. Remember when we traded for those few cubes? The shopkeeper told us about the hub. He said that's where people go when they're looking for opportunities to start anew. Hey, guys. I think we've rested enough. It's time for us to move on. We need to find some food. You know, Rook, I feel like we've been wandering around for too long now. I'm tired of going for days without eating something. We've talked about doing something with our lives for a while now, making a real difference in the world. I think if we could make it to the hub, we could begin there, really make a name for ourselves. Hey, I like that idea. You and me, we could go together. You're like a brother to me, Hot Dog. Wouldn't that be something? Hot Dog and Rook, legends of the land. <laughs> and what about these guys? Do you think they'd want to come with us to the hub? Well, we can cross that bridge once we get some food in our stomachs. But we were ambushed by a much larger group of raiders than we've ever encountered before that converged on us. The only way to escape safely was to split up and scatter. Rook, travel west. Meet me at the hub. We'll shake these guys and meet back up there. Be careful, hot dog. Lay low and I'll find you. I'll see you again soon. I've escaped worse. I'll lose this guy in no time. Make sure I get to the hub. I'll see you then, brother. Little did I know that this would be the last time that I'd see hot dog. He made it to the hub before me and met his fate there. I failed him. I'm sorry, hot dog. For a brief moment, Rook was lost in memories from long ago. Suddenly, he snapped back to reality and remembered where he was. The harsh realization set in. His home and all of his friends were being sacked by the Holy Nation while he was out trying to rescue Mac and Agnew. He felt a helpless sense of fear as he realized that there wasn't anything he could do to stop them. Rook was desperate. He was trying to hurry and take out the Swamp Ninjas to protect Agnew, then he could save Mac. Together, they took out the men and finished off their crossbowmen. It was a disaster back in New Raleigh. The gate was breached and most of the men were already beaten down by their troops. Fravatar tried holding them off for as long as he could but was completely overwhelmed. They tried to secure the gate, but once it was opened, they were attacked and left for dead while the Holy Nation burst through, only seeking the destruction of their home. There were just too many of them. They couldn't even hide from their forces. Even in a critical state, Wands not tried fending them off, but he was too weak. He was crushed by the swing of the paladin's cross and knocked unconscious. Fravatar quietly groaned under his crab armor while trying to crawl to safety while the Holy Nation troops ran through their buildings and pillaged whatever they found. Sparta lost an arm and like many others, he was slowly dying at their gate. Fravatar was still laying low and saw that the main attack finally ended and most of the enemy was leaving. Though, a few men stayed behind, one of these men being the leader of the attack. The High Inquisitor Valtina, the military commander of Oaken Shield, one of the Holy Nation's highest ranking officials. He was extremely strong and stayed at the center of New Raleigh calling out for Rook to face him. He said that the Holy Lord Phoenix personally asked him to lead the attack and not to return without Rook's body. Valtina was arrogant and cocky. Rook's men used this to their advantage. Fravatar was one of the few that could still walk. He helped Rook tend to the wounded. Rook apologized and frantically tried helping as much as he could. It seemed foolish for Valtina to dismiss most of his guard, but Rook knew his intentions. He wanted the glory and praise for their victory all for himself. Rook intended to leverage Valtina's own arrogance against him. Once his men were stabilized, he went on the offensive. It was getting dark, so Rook crept through the shadows to take out as many lingering Holy Nation men as he could. The lone paladin dropped like a rock as Rook clobbered him over the head. When he hit the ground, Rook disarmed him and stripped him of his armor so he wouldn't be a threat. Next, he approached Fravatar and asked him to trade his armor with him. Fravatar was confused, but Rook assured him that he needed to be fully prepared if he was to fight Valtina. He was an extremely powerful warrior after all, and Rook wasn't sure if he'd be able to take him on alone. Before initiating any fights though, Rook helped sneak his men into their inn to recover from the fighting. 
Valtina was busy yelling out into the darkness, mocking Rook and trying to provoke him. They didn't take the bait though. They worked through the entire night, hiding in the shadows and bringing in their men to the beds to rest up. That was until Rockius took the bait. He was furious at what they did and blinded by rage, he engaged with Valtina and his small remaining guard. With such little effort, Rockius was crushed by the mighty blows from his heavy cross. He spit on Rockius and cursed him. As Valtina was scoffing at the dying skeleton at his feet, he looked up and frowned as he saw a Shek patrol that happened to be passing through New Raleigh. He didn't anticipate the Shek's interference. The Shek hated the Holy Nation almost as much as Rook did. Realizing Valtino was caught off guard in a vulnerable position, they immediately closed in on him. Rook knew that he was too strong to take on alone. Luck was still on his side as the Holy Nation was suddenly outnumbered completely. Now was the time to strike back. Rook fought with half the Shek patrol to take out Valtina's guard. The Paladin was still a strong warrior and put up a good fight. Rook looked at the other Shek group and saw that they were all taken out single-handedly by Valtina. He charged Rook and the other Shek. Valtina's guard fell, and Rook heard Agnew roar as he ran in and joined the fray. Even while being completely surrounded by skilled Shek fighters, Rook and Agnew, the High Inquisitor seemed to keep his cool. He screamed as he landed a heavy blow that went through Agnew's guard and caused the skeleton to crumble to the ground. A powerful fighter indeed. Rook was angry, but he could sense Valtina's rage with every strike he parried, and even if they landed a hit on him, he seemed to shrug it off and continue holding his own against Rook and six Shek fighters. Even so, he was just one man and even the High Inquisitor had his limits. The fighting continued for what felt like an eternity. Rook had a handful of allies fighting with him and even he was getting tired. They could see it in Valtina's eyes. Through the hate and determination, there was exhaustion, and more importantly, fear. His swings and reaction times were getting slower. They were whittling him down until he couldn't defend himself any longer. Finally, after fighting for over an hour straight, they brought him down. Rook couldn't believe it. Without the Shek patrolling through their home, they never would have been able to defeat Valtina. He thanked the Shek soldiers for their aid as he stripped the High Inquisitor of his gear. They didn't care for his thanks. All they wanted was to take down the High Commander of the Holy Nation, and they succeeded in that. Regardless, Rook owed the Shek for saving them a second time now. He picked up his limp body and slung him over his shoulder. He applied bandages to his own wounds and decided since the Shek were the main reason Valtina was defeated, he would take him to Squin and leave him as a prisoner. The Shek would be able to decide his fate. Rook's men suffered heavy blows from the attack. He wasn't even sure of all the damages they inflicted on New Raleigh, but capturing one of the Holy Nation's highest ranking commanders was a big blow to them too. And Valtina had quite the bounty on his head. That would help with the continued funding and growth of New Raleigh. Squin was the nearest Shek city, so Rook began heading there with Valtina's unconscious body. He wouldn't let the Phoenix get away with this. It would be different next time, Rook thought to himself. Squin wasn't very far away and Rook made it there in good time. He felt a bit of relief as he saw the gates to the city in front of him. The Shek guards scoffed at Rook. They knew that their own men were the biggest cause of Valtina's defeat and looked down upon non-Shek fighters. Rook didn't mind though. Who knows what would have happened if it wasn't for the Shek and their help. He didn't want to think about it. He saw the police station on the other end of Squin and made his way to it. As he walked inside, he found the captain and spoke with him immediately. He looked Rook's prisoner over and smiled. Rook simply nodded and handed the High Inquisitor over and was given a reward of 40,000 cats in return. Valtina was stripped of his clothes and pride and was tied to a prisoner stake where he'd hopefully rot for a long time. He heard him screaming at the Shek while they bandaged his wounds to make sure he didn't die too quickly. Rook's work here was done. It was time for damage control back home. Even though the worst of the attack was over, things were moving so fast that he didn't have a chance to really check on the well-being of his men. In the aftermath of the battle, Sparta and Awinger both lost an arm and a leg. Fortunately, that was the worst of it. The rest of the men were just beaten to a pulp and would heal in time. Agnew brought Awinger a spare robotic leg that they had in storage. It was a good thing Rook was so keen on looting these things while he traveled. Agnew laid him on the rooftop and continued working. Awinger looked at the leg and attached it to where his was missing. The robotic limb did the rest of the work as it linked itself to his nerves and began functioning like his missing limb did. He was still missing an arm and they didn't have any spare left limbs for him to use, but at least he'd be able to get around for now. Sparta was a little less lucky and they could only find a replacement arm, but they didn't have a right leg replacement. He attached the arm and winced in pain as it made the connections to his body. He still wasn't going to be able to get around very easily until he had a replacement leg to install. He laid there, frustrated at his situation, but there wasn't much else he could do at the moment. When Rook returned, he cleaned up the remaining Holy Nation men that were left lingering at their base. Once he took care of the last of the mess that was left behind from everything, they shut the gates to lock themselves in New Raleigh and laid low for a bit. Rook realized that they definitely would have the attention of the Holy Lord Phoenix once he realized that Valtina was taken as a prisoner. They had to be prepared for any future retaliation. He also planned for another building to be constructed. They laid the plans out for a new longhouse that would be used for another one of Rook's plans. 
but more on that later. He found Sparta and picked him up. He apologized him for what happened. Rook felt personally responsible for the attack on their home since he provoked the Holy Nation at Okran's fist and Narco's trap. He was going to take Sparta to the Hiver's camp and get him a replacement leg that would at least allow him to get around. Meanwhile, they haven't forgotten about their robotic guest and Allwinger stopped by to deliver a poorly crafted katana to its cell. It was going to need it. It held the crude weapon in its hands and responded with a simple, okay, like it understood what would come next. Kravatar entered the training hall and Ryan joined him shortly after. The new men were split into a new group of trainees, and to begin, Ryan and Fravatar would spar with their new skeleton friend. The door slowly closed behind them and they made sure it was locked. They weren't entirely sure of how this whole thing would turn out. Furnished with their most protective armor and weakest katanas, they were prepared to start duking it out for as long as they could stand. Ryan unlocked the cage and it got out. It just stood there for a moment until Ryan moved ever so slightly and it reacted so quickly that both of the men were caught off guard. It was fast and strong. It was a good thing they were equipped with crab armor because it would evade their blocks and land most of its attacks while shrugging off most of their swings with its crude weapon. Even with such a weak blade, the head of agriculture inflicted a decent amount of damage to the men with each hit it landed. It got to the point where Wansnot was caught in to moderate the fighting while Fravatar split off and healed up. After he finished, Ryan backed off to recover while Fravatar continued their engagement with it. Its strength and technique was far greater than theirs. This was exactly the kind of training that they needed if they wanted to become stronger. While they continued sparring, Rook arrived at the robotic shop at the nearby hive. He found the shopkeeper who was glad to see Rook again. He commented on how they brought their hive a lot of business in the past. Rook frowned by the hiver's words of encouragement and proceeded to buy a low-grade leg so Sparta could walk again. After they fashioned the leg to him, Rook made sure to purchase an arm replacement for Awinger too. They'd be faster if Rook just carried Sparta back to New Raleigh and even against his protests, Rook took off towards their home with Sparta yelling at him to be put down. Back home, Wansnot switched gear with Ryan and joined the fighting since things were starting to get a little out of hand and Ryan was knocked out cold. Fravatar was slowly beaten to a pulp. Even while fully covered in crab armor, he finally passed out from the beatdown that the head of agriculture gave him. Wansnot was even using his good weapon but was still struggling to take on the skeleton. Mac had to come in for extra damage control to help shoot it down while Wansnot took the brunt of the fighting. Finally, after almost taking down a third man with a dull katana, the head of agriculture was knocked into a reboot state and collapsed. This training was a little more intense than they initially anticipated. Wansnot scooped the limp robot up and limped back over to his holding cell while the rest of the men healed up. Mac went over to the skeleton and used his repair kit to fix up the damage inflicted to it. He finished tending to it and the others continued to bandage themselves up. The head of agriculture was still rebooting so the men used this opportunity to rest up in their beds too. They took quite the beating after all. Wansnot was added to the list of trainees and after healing up from the first fight, they gathered together in the training hall again to continue honing their fighting skills. The door was closed behind them and locked. Wansnot ran over and opened the cage. The skeleton stepped out and just stood there looking at Wansnot. It could speak, but it remained silent. As soon as Wansnot made even the slightest movement, the skeleton lit into him. It seemed to understand what was going on and was complacent with the situation it was in. The head of agriculture was clearly skilled in the art of combat as it quickly danced between the three men, shrugging off most of their attacks even with its poorly crafted weapon and landing 10 hits before they could even touch it. This was good for the men though. Not only were they quickly improving their own skills, they were becoming tougher from the beating they were receiving and they were learning better fighting techniques. They were really hurt, but this time, they were able to take down the skeleton before any of them were knocked out. They were already making some progress. Wansnot scooped up the skeleton and placed it back into its cell and began repairing it. While Wansnot took care of that, Fravatar reapplied bandages to everyone. Things would be much easier if they could finish building the skeleton repair bed in the training hall, but they were lacking electrical components. The men were resting up from another beating with the skeleton captive. Rook returned with Sparta and they delivered the replacement arm for Awinger to use. He attached it and even though it was a little shoddy, he had two functioning arms again and he was very pleased. While the trainees rested, Rook traded his good weapons with Ryan's low grade katana. He could also hone his fighting skills with the head of agriculture. He went inside the training hall and got it out of its cell. They began sparring immediately. Even at Rook's skill level, he was struggling to keep up with the skeleton's attacks. He was holding his own better than the others, but he was still taking way more hits than he was landing. The rest of the trainees were covered enough to join the fighting. As they came in and surrounded the skeleton, Rook backed off to heal up. He really got bruised up himself. The other men kept it busy enough and once Rook finished tending to his wounds, he joined back in until it was knocked out into a reboot. Rook placed it back into the cell once again and the men went through healing their wounds from the fight. Wansnot took some time to repair their captive again, but they only had limited repair kits. They needed to finish their repair bed, which would be a much more efficient means to mend wounds that were inflicted during their sparring sessions. 
Since electrical components were hard to come by, they decided it would make more sense to craft the materials in-house. They planned out an electrical workbench and finished its construction by the following morning. Mac worked on the parts that they needed, and one more day later, they finished building the training hall's skeleton repair bed. Since they now had access to all the necessary components for building these beds, they let out two more and added Rockius and Agnew to the group of trainees. They released the skeleton again and continued honing their combat skills against it. It was getting to the point where they could collectively group up and take it out with relative ease. It took a while, but they made it work. Once it was knocked out, Agnew picked it up and placed it into the repair bed. As it was rebooting, the bed would come to life and work on any damaged parts until it fully rebooted and climbed out of the bed, ready to fight once more. While they were sparring, Sparta snuck in and finished working on another one of the beds. This way, Rockius and Agnew could repair their own damage while the other men took on the head of agriculture. Every time it collapsed from the fighting, the men would take the time to tend to their wounds and make sure that they were in good fighting condition for when the skeleton rebooted so they could constantly hone their skills. That night, after it was knocked out yet again, Rook decided it was time to equip it with some of Ryan's finest crab armor that he's made. This would make it much more durable, and the men would be able to fight with the skeleton much longer before they'd be able to knock it out. Rook didn't care for running around in his underwear with a crab helmet on, so he ran to their armory and grabbed another set to put on. As Rook continued to spar with the head of agriculture, his skills were quickly growing. The men were focusing on using katanas since not only did this help their melee skills, it also increased their dexterity. They were becoming more skilled and nimble while training with this blade. Their defensive skills and toughness were rapidly increasing too as they were getting beaten to a pulp most of the time. Of course during every sparring session Rook had, he felt pity for his captive. It was being held here against its will, but he knew he had to dirty their hands if they wanted to become expert fighters. A few more days passed and they added regular beds for the other men to rest between fights. They refined their process down to a very efficient method. One of the men would engage with the skeleton in solo combat. While they dueled, the rest of the men rested and healed their wounds. Once the current fighter was beaten down too much, he would flee to an open skeleton repair bed to heal all their wounds while the next trainee and Q would continue fighting their captive. Even the humans could use the repair beds. This worked much faster than regular bandages and they weren't wasting their supplies either. Once all their wounds were tended to, they would rest in a regular bed to fully recover from their round of fighting. Many more days passed. Their combat skills, toughness, and dexterity were all becoming much more refined, but they weren't getting proper strength training. Rook's solution? He had them fill huge backpacks full of iron and had them travel to the hub and back. They could barely walk while hauling this massive weight on their backs, but it built up their strength very quickly. The other men were still alternating between fighting so that there was never a moment of downtime unless the head of agriculture was rebooting. And while they were becoming much better fighters, they were still getting a severe beatdown against their captive. This was good because that meant that there was less time where the skeleton was knocked out and more time where Rook's men were fighting and mastering their technique. Rook decided it was time for him to take a break from the combat and focus on training his strength. He loaded another backpack full of raw iron ore and began the same hike to the hub that Rockius was doing. The next phase of their plan was to utilize their recently constructed longhouse to build hemp processors. Rook didn't like the idea of manufacturing drugs, but this trade could be extremely profitable and they could sneak into the Holy Nation's cities, sell the drugs there, and drain their funds while poisoning their population with drug addictions from within. He knew it was a dirty tactic, but Rook wanted to use every means possible to weaken the Holy Nation. Their time of reckoning was coming soon. Everything was in place and the men that weren't trainees focused on using their hemp crops for hashish production. If they could find the right city with a demand, they would be able to earn a lot of money doing this to help fund New Raleigh. At this point, Rook, Fravitar, Ryan, Wansnot, Rockius, and Agnew were much stronger than they were before they began their training. And while their combat skills were massively improved, it was time they collectively built up their strength. They mined enough ore so that everyone had bags full of raw iron to haul around. Once everyone was prepared, they began their rounds to the hub and back. They continued their non-stop training for an entire month. Every single one of them was much stronger than before, including Rook. This was their only gap and it was time they fully committed to that. On their way to the hub, a group of dust bandits tried to ambush their training group. Most of them still had their low-grade training weapons on hand, but they engaged regardless. It was a massacre. The armor Ryan crafted for them was superb and they shrugged off most, if not all, the damage inflicted on them. Not only that, but even with shoddy weapons, their combat skills greatly outmatched the meager dust bandits. The men dropped like flies as Rook's group slowly moved in on them and destroyed their whole attack force. They made it up to the hub and back without any other problems. They marched on a single line as they were crossing the swamp back to New Raleigh. Everyone was bragging about how they were on Rook's level now. Rook chuckled and asked if any of them wanted to test that claim and they all fell silent for a few seconds until they all burst out laughing together. 
Confidence was high as they marched together, slowly building up their strength. They marched back and forth from New Raleigh to the hub for almost two weeks straight. At this point, Rook was tired of wearing his clunky crab armor. He finally took his armor off and slid his dust coat back on. He felt like a new man as he changed back into his regular outfit. The rest of the men equipped their regular weapons, and they went into the north gate where a group of Kral's chosen were harassing Rook's men. It was time to test their skills with real weapons this time. Rook could hardly believe his eyes. The Shek were powerful warriors, yet they were melting like butter against Rook's men. Their training was definitely paying off. Before they even knew it, the group of Kral's chosen were defeated. This time, instead of going to the hub, they made their way to the nearby way station. They still moved slowly while hauling their loads of iron, but the days of aching backs and sore legs paid off as well. They arrived late into the night and entered the shop. It was time to get rid of their iron and build up New Raleigh's funds even further. Rook sold every last iron ore in his bag and he felt a hundred times lighter. The other men followed after Rook. They sold as much as they could until they completely ran out of cats and couldn't buy any more from them. Later that day, Rook returned and got together with Mac again. He had another mission for the two of them. While the trainees were honing their skills, the rest of the men built a huge stockpile of hashish. Rook and Mac filled their backpacks with the drugs and left for the East Gate. It was time to infiltrate the Holy Nation territory. Mac wasn't a fan of selling hashish, but he agreed with Rook that it would be a good way to hurt their economy while growing theirs. They reviewed their maps and began traveling north towards Stack and Blister Hill. Their first destination would be Stack. As they approached the gates of the city, something seemed different. They got closer and saw that it was a Shek guard protecting the gate. The city of Stack was mostly in ruins. They went into the HQ and spoke to a Shek warrior and asked what happened. He explained that once Rook brought the High Inquisitor Valtina, there was a window of opportunity where the Holy Nation was vulnerable. While they didn't want to launch an all-out war, they took advantage of the situation and brought down the Phoenix's other High Commander, Seda, and claimed the ruins of Stack as Shek territory. They advised Rook and Mac not to approach Blister Hill though. The Holy Lord Phoenix was on high alert and they would most certainly get caught if they attempted to enter their capital. Rook spoke with Mac briefly about their plans. Tensions were high with the Shek and Holy Nation. They needed to get rid of their hashish and report back to New Raleigh to adjust their plans. Rook told Mac to head east of the United Cities and try and find a place to sell their goods. Rook was going to check out World's End to see what he could do there. In the meantime, the men back home were building a weaponsmith so they could forge their own weapons and fully supply their own men. Rook made it to World's End in no time. He wasn't sure the best place to do this, so he found a traveler's shop and he spoke to the vendor. The shopkeeper smiled when he saw what Rook was offering to sell. This was a side business that he happened to run and their supplies were running low. For 122 cats a pop, Rook thought it seemed like a good deal and decided to sell the hashish to the man. It wasn't going to impact the Holy Nation like he initially planned, but he wanted to be rid of it for now so he could get back to New Raleigh. He sold him every last bit of his stash and began his hasty return home. During all this, Mac was heading east to Flats Lagoon of the United Cities territory. He arrived a little later and found a nearby bar that was still open. Mac approached the barkeeper and awkwardly proposed selling him his bulk supply of hashish. He wasn't sure how to approach this kind of conversation. The United Cities were a foul bunch. Slavery and drugs ran rampant in their cities, and neither Rook or Mac minded selling drugs to them. Especially when they were buying it for 760 cats apiece? It looked like Rook sold his supplies at the wrong city. Mac gladly sold as much as the barkeeper could afford, but he still had a lot of his stash left over after the barkeep ran out of cats. As he was about to leave to look for other shops, he overheard two men speaking by the bar. They were talking about the Holy Nation. Mac stopped and listened for a moment. They mentioned how the Shek had both High Inquisitors, Valtina and Seda, in their captivity. Word travels fast and from the sounds of it, the Holy Nation was feeling the loss of their two highest commanders under the Holy Lord Phoenix. Mac was glad that the Holy Nation was slowly crumbling after their attack on New Raleigh. He went to another nearby shop and sold the remaining hashish there for a great profit. While Mac was finishing up at Flats Lagoon, Rook decided to make one last visit to the scrap house at the Black Desert City. He was looking for something very specific there. He arrived quickly. Time was of the essence while the Holy Nation was getting hit by the Shek army. He went up to the scrap house and found the skeleton vendor there. He began to browse its wares, sifting past the weapons in stock. He found it. Blueprints for exotic weapons, namely the Falling Sun. This was the very last thing Rook needed before they'd be ready. Ryan had already become a master armorsmith and made the finest crab armor they could ever wish for. Now it was time to equip them with equally powerful weapons. Rook thanked the skeleton for his time and he learned the tech for his men. He went back home and gave the plans to Ryan. He began working on learning the technique for weapon crafting immediately. Rook had only one last trip to make. 
He grabbed the remaining supply of hashish at their base and made his way to Flat's Lagoon. When he got there, he spoke to a shopkeeper and sold the last of their supply. Rook knew that the United Cities were just as bad as the Holy Nation. Taking their money and flooding their cities with these drugs was a subtle way for them to hit them while they prepared to wage war in the Holy Nation. After selling the rest of their drugs to Flat's Lagoon, Rook prepared to travel back home. Brian worked at weaponsmithing non-stop for almost two weeks straight while the others continued training. His hard work and determination paid off, though. He learned how to master the technique of forging expertly crafted blades. The recipe for the Falling Sun was perfect. After working countless days straight, he finally finished it. It was an Edge Type 1 grade Falling Sun, even better than Rook's own weapon. Brian was almost finished. He finally mastered the art of crafting the finest quality weapons and just needed to make enough supply for the rest of the men. Eight days later, it was done. Rook and his men had been preparing for this moment for a long time. Each of them were furnished with an Edge Type 1 Falling Sun and Katana. 74 days after New Raleigh was sacked by the Holy Nation, they were finally ready to take the fight to them while they were weak. Rook called for a meeting later that evening to discuss what their plans were moving forward. The time to wage war in the Holy Nation was just around the corner. They were the seven that planned to take them on. Will the Holy Lord Phoenix be ready for them? Find out on the next episode of the Chronicles of Rook. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I want to shout out the extremely talented Rykon Roleplays and thank him for his help voicing Hot Dog at the beginning of the video. If you aren't subscribed to him already, click on the card in the top right corner of the screen and check him out. Trust me, his channel's worth your time. If you want to keep up to date on this series and other narrative content I release, please consider subscribing to the channel. If you'd like to help support the channel even further, you can become a patron or a YouTube member, which has great perks like early access to viewing my videos and becoming a named character in future videos. You can also pick up an awesome poster or t-shirt to show your love for the series. I also want to shout out my newest patrons, Eric Clark, Bashish Johansson, Danny Helino, and Otto Dave, who upgraded to a veteran patron status. Thanks so much, guys. I also want to make a huge shout out to Clammed Oyster, who became an S tier patron, which is absolutely incredible. Thanks so much, man. I really appreciate you. And a big, big shout out to all my patrons who are helping support the channel so that I can one day turn this hobby into a full time gig. I appreciate all your help so much. Thanks, guys. And as always, thanks for watching. And until next time, have a good one.